Hello and welcome to episode 3 of the TA Fit Mind Motivation Podcast. In this series, I want to delve a little deeper into the lives of exceptional human beings with a thirst for growing, developing and evolving, with the intention to discover and share their stories and what it takes to be in their shoes and how we can learn from their victories and errors to become better ourselves. Using fitness as a common topic, which in my eyes encompasses everything from training to injuries, to injury prevention, to mindset, to stress management, to diet, to biohacking, to lifestyle, and many, many more. In this episode, I talk with ex-Olympian and European judo champion, Ruina Birch. Ruina is a colleague and friend of mine from the University of Manchester Sports Scholarship Program, where we help athletes on their journey to master their chosen sport and simultaneously excel in their academic pathways. Ruina and I sat down and spoke about her career in judo, and in coaching, her Olympic journey, the postponed 2020 Olympics, the situation with sport in general, her life after sport, and her new career as a financial wealth manager. It's here I want to add about her wealth management role, as we didn't really get into it much in the episode. As part of her role, she advises athletes and educates them on the importance of wealth management, which is an area within sport that's usually neglected, and something that I wish I had been in touch with during my playing career. So if you want to find out more, need help go to pressfieldwm.co.uk and i'll link her site in the show notes on my website and there'll be a link on youtube as well just wanted to say before i start as a disclaimer this is for entertainment purposes only and is not should not be used as financial advice for any of the opinions that i or rowena mentioned in this episode so without any further ado here's episode three of the ta fit my motivation enjoy and I wanted to get you on because I'm trying to get a kind of a plethora of different athletes and it's, you know, individual sports. I've had a coach on, I've had obviously rugby players on, um, team sports and things. But um, and the, the reason I kind of looking forward to kind of speaking to you is the fact that you've had such a, um, a colorful career. So, so to say, and you've obviously gone through the whole um, Olympic kind of uh, journey and all, all the things previous to you now working and you've been coaching and then you've been, working now in, in the normal world. So if I just kind of run through what I've kind of got, <laughs> what I've got yeah. down here, let me see if I don't butcher anything. <laughs> okay, so Ru- formerly Rowena Sweetman, that's, how you, that's what you competed at as um, in, in your, obviously in your heyday, you, you Olympic, uh, you went to the Olympics in 1996. Yeah, you're two times, um, you're one time European champion and you got a one bronze medal. Time, yeah, and a bronze so medal. One, one, one time European champion, that was 1994. Yes. Oh, okay, and then you did a bronze medal uh, that was previous. I think it was ninety six. Was it under ninety six? And that's your under under sixty six kilograms. Your, your weight division wasn't that's it? Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, and then you've all also been a multiple World Cup medal, multiple World Cup medals you've had in uh, I think six or seven times or something like that. And yeah. then you um, you've been British champ twice. <laughs> you know it better than me. <laughs> British champ twice. And anyway, and then you can go. You can go on to be honest. And then um, you also come Commonwealth twice as well. And um, I got some stats together that you're a 64.8 percent win rate out of all your all your fights that you had, which is pretty impressive. Um, I did some digging to find that out. I just wanted to find something that was that you wouldn't know. It's something that you wouldn't know about. You have to lose a lot as well as win, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then and then you went on to obviously coach and you did the under 18s and then you did the national team itself and then after that kind of obviously where I met you working for the university and um, then you went down a financial route. So like yeah. there's a lot kind of sport and non-sport things. So I'd just like to, is that a, de- a decent <laughs> introduction yeah, of definitely, your... Definitely, definitely. That, that's my sort of, my career journey. Yeah. It's very much in sport and sport. And then now it's having a different role. But again, it looks like it's going to, I'm, I'm pushing it to be involved with sport, working, helping sports with, finan- with well, helping the people in sports with their financial planning. So we've got like a programme coming um, that I'm putting together at the moment to do with the judo, yeah. um, to support the whole athletes, but working as a team a little bit more with a sports psychologist and yeah. nutritionist to make sure it's integrated. So firstly, help. I just firstly I just want to speak how about how you got from um, your obviously your your career in terms of how you, how you how you got from that your career and your transition to your your, your role now because because I'm in that kind of period of my life myself it's uh, and obviously the uh, the, uh, the sports scholarship panel we were kind of orchestrating those kind of moves with the young, yeah. younger the younger generation so how how was like how did you find your transition because I saw that you you had an engineering degree then you went to uh, finance what's what kind of how did that pan out I think 
I mean, to start off with, I would say that transitioning out of sport when it's always been your life, your main goal, really hard yeah. because you, um, you know, one, one thing you're used to actually having regular occasions, whether it's competitions or whatever, where you sort of reaffirm how you're doing and it's very visible, you're either winning or you're not winning. Whereas in real, in real life, it's often a lot more murky. It's yeah. hard to tell you, are, are you along the right lines? Are you doing the right thing? Yeah. Um, and it also there's that expectation because you want to be the best at what you do and you, you've got to just sort of let go of that a little bit. And, and you've got to start at the bottom and build up like you did with your sport. Yeah. Um, and that's a sort of slightly changing mindset because otherwise you can end up getting frozen, unable to do anything because you're just like, I don't know everything. I'm not really brilliant at this. And, and nice. you've got to learn. So it's going back to that. You know, when you, you, you've you lost a match or you, um, for me, I've, I've lost a fight. You, you, you've you got to treat it as, okay, that's just part of the journey. How do I learn from this? Yeah. And, and keep taking on the challenges and keep learning from it and sort of remind yourself that is the way to get to be the best. Yeah. I, I, I myself have uh, kind of recently struggled with those kind of things because like you said, you, it's a totally new set of skills to be in a working environment, to, to network and to, to do kind of obviously things that aren't expected of you in, in, in a sporting environment. Whereas you can, in a sporting environment, it's like, like you said, it's spoon fed a lot more. So it's like, you've got this, you've got the day, blah, blah. But those skills and those attributes as an ex-professional, I think that in realizing that, they, they are very useful skills to have like they become once you start to play to break your day down into kind of what you want to do how you're going to how you're going to progress that day that week blah, blah blah i really think those kind of attributes help us athletes uh progress into those kind of you know into the Absolutely. professional I think, I think it's it's tapping into those past experiences using that past career thinking about well, what would i have done in my sport when you know even when something's gone wrong how did how would i coat how did you build a team around you i think team's really important having the right people around you yeah. you don't have to be brilliant at everything but yeah. you do need to know someone who's brilliant at everything kind of thing so building that team so you're not trying to do it all yeah. um and i think Absolutely. there's sort of there's other things with with sport like you say there's there's the planning but there's also the always trying to get where's the opportunity you know what well, okay this has happened say you know this recent climate we've been in how do i make the most of that opportunity what can i really do now um and it's a bit like when you get injured you know you can't i remember breaking my arm and i couldn't couldn't do and yeah. couldn't do the judo but wow what an opportunity to actually start doing some weight training on my legs and get my legs really strong and working yeah. around the injury yeah. do some psychology stuff so it's it's, it's a bit of that i think is is you take that into your new world where, as you transition, but you almost have to consciously do it. It doesn't necessarily come naturally. Yeah, but I think that, um, well, considering obviously the, the kind of career that you've had, I think it does come naturally to, to you really because you ha I know I've, it might not feel like it does, but I, I'm, I think I'm, the, I'm a bit the same in the, in the respect that I feel like I'm, do I'm, I'm always working towards something, but then I don't know what I'm actually working towards. I know I'm doing things and I'm always active because I hate not doing something. And it kind of feels like that's what you were kind of trying to say there, that you you always got to be working towards a goal, whether it doesn't matter what kind of goal it is, as long as you're working towards a direction, you're not, you're just not stopping. You just like that. You saw an opportunity there. You brought your arm. So then you said, thought, okay, I'll do my, I'll do leg training. I saw an opportunity with this client, with this current climate to set up an online business instead of doing a business that's, that's out yeah. on the high street. So it's like the simple, we've got that kind of similar mindset, but that, I think that does come from being, I don't know whether it is, I don't know. Is, do you think that comes through uh, sporting discipline as a youngster? I think, I think it, it, it does. I, th I can relate totally to that, actually, where's my big goal? And when you don't know where your big goal is, there's nothing worse because you're like, I love, love nothing more than like, oh, this is where I'm heading. It doesn't mean I don't have to get there. But I love to know what, where am I aiming at? Where can I build the strategy towards? And, and sometimes that takes time to actually find the direction. And you have to go in a, a wiggly worthy one because you have to go and have a look. You have to open some boxes to see, you know, yeah. what's that like? Where does my skills fit there? Do I enjoy it? Yeah. Is, there a, is that a place where I want to be? And um, so for me with the, the financial planning, Initially, it was a box that was open for me, and someone suggested it. Why didn't you know? I think you'd be really good as a financial advisor. And I just thought, really? 
why, why, why on earth? You know, it was never on my radar. Yeah. But as I found out more about the work, and, and it's very much working with people, it's coaching people, helping them yeah. think about their goals. What are they trying to achieve? Helping them put in some contingency plans. You know, if, if something goes wrong, how are you going to prevent it being sort of a total disaster? Which yeah. is exactly what you do in sport. So yeah. um, it all started to align. And then there's, there's also, the, you know, there's a real need, I think, for a more planned approach to for young sports people and also people working in sport. 100%, um, yeah, for, definitely. For financial understanding, financial planning, because, I mean, I think for professional footballers, it's about 40% are bankrupt within five years. And that affects their marriages, it affects everything. And with a bit of earlier planning, or planning at the time, and a bit of support, someone in their team who knows a bit about it, that can help yeah. stop them falling into some sort of quick win schemes that aren't actually what they appear. Yeah. So, so in terms of, I'm, I'm quite interested in myself, because um, I, during the pan, uh, during the, the current climate, I started to invest myself. Um, but it was kind of like off my own back, because I thought, I had a little bit of money, a little capital, and I just decided that uh, I read a book about from Tony Robbins quite a while back, and it said like invest in a downturn market. So I started to buy up a few stronger, steady stocks that I knew wouldn't gonna, aren't going to fold, like your Amazons, your Facebooks, your your Tesla. And I, I've obviously I've kind of done pretty well from it. Is that the kind of thing that you kind of do now? Would you be advising me that way, or is it like is it more like real estate or moving your money around, or is it? So with, 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 with the company I work with, so I'm with St. James's Place, and we've actually got like an investment committee, so I don't have to be the person who researches where the best fund managers are, what are they doing, and so we, we bring in experts that travel around the world to actually identify different fund managers, and not just looking at the ones that are doing really well now, looking at how they go about investing the money and what they do when the markets turn down and yeah. how they react to things and are they focused. So the way, the way that I, I would go about, the way that I sort of advise people to go about investing is use the experts to, to, to look at where they invest, who can monitoring, monitor it all the time. I can't know enough about it. There's so much yeah. out there. Well, I like information like anything. It's, it's crazy. Like, well, since I started just messing around with it, you can just keep reading books and books and books, and you're just never going to get to the bottom of it. Yeah. But like the kind of the kind of thing that I kind of kept going back to is like um, Vanguard ETFs, a Vanguard ETF, or an ETF, a, a, a fund that you don't have to worry about, like a nutmeg. Or that's the kind of if a few of my friends have asked me, and I just said, oh, just there's a Vanguard and a nutmeg, but don't listen to me. It's, it's your own money, it's not mine. But they're the kind of things that just I. Kind of, you don't have to worry about them. They're just already managed funds, and you get like charged not point one percent or something like that. But anyway, we're, we're digressing. We're digressing a little bit. We're digressing off sport, aren't we? <laughs> just a little bit. It doesn't have to be sport. It's about everything. Um. So anyway, so I, what I wanted to kind of go on from there is um, like my fitness regime. Uh, in, as a professional athlete, rugby player, we've covered a lot from interviewing rugby players, sportsmen uh, in, in 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 team sports. So what was it like to be uh, a judoka, is it? <laughs> yes, was yeah, it? Like? Yes. Remember it. <laughs> what's it like to be a judoka and what's the kind of day to day training for a, a, a judoka? And obviously, how would that have changed today? I, I mean, I've got a friend called Owen Livesley, you might know him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Owen. So yeah. I, he went to my school, so I, I kind of, he's in, he's in like amazing shape. So he's not, I've, I've not spoken to him in, in a while, but I mean, I'm sure you'll be able to tell me what kind of a day to day training regime would be. Yeah, I think it, it depends at different times of your career and, and when your events are and, and what sort of player you are. Um, very much judo can be it's quite, you know, one, of the, one of the best ways to do is to use what you've got and, and build on that. So some, some people, some judo players will be very, very fast, very um, hit and run, hit and run, hit and run, very aerobic. And other ones are very, very explosive. You need a bit of both, yeah. but some people would focus more than others. But typical sort of training when I was competing I'd be training in the mornings um, probably four or five times a week and we'd do things like um, I trained with actually my judo coach he was a, he was a, a PE teacher at Cheatham's Music School so I used to go in there right. and sometimes we'd run with some of the other students and then we'd go to this old railway bridge and 
sprint up it, it'd be shouting, go up there now, <laughs> you'd just be, feel like crying when yeah, you're trying yeah. to crack. your legs are dead, and then you go, right, get down here now, right, piggybacks, and you piggyback each other up, yeah. up the, um, the railway bridge. And then you come back and then other days we'd be doing weights, all sorts of different weights, whether it's a circuit or, or specifics, or we might do rowing machines. So very much working on your, your all over body fitness. Yeah. To protect that, a lot of that does protect against injury. And then in the evenings we'd be doing judo, and weekends judo. Yeah, so you, so were you uh, one of the lucky ones who was sponsored and paid or you weren't sponsored and paid? At those times it was obviously amateur, so how did... How did you kind of find balance in yeah. managing your life around that as well? So initially, when, when I was sort of getting very more serious on it, I ended up teaching judo in school, so I had my own business. And that allowed me to train in the morning. I teach judo in the afternoons and then train right. in the evenings. Um, I pretty much carried that on throughout my career, really, actually. That, that's what supported me. But once I'd got major medals, I then had some Sport England funding. Um, UK sport funding and yeah. which wasn't huge but it was you know it's very very welcome thank you yeah but like it's uh it's pretty savvy to use your niche and like make a you know like a coaching thing so that's uh well done to you there like that's not many people would take have the foresight to go and do that which is really good obviously a necessity at the time as well yeah. with having to support yourself and I, I suppose there'll be a lot of a lot of uh, similarities with this year and, and the current like Olympians for next year, I suppose, because I, I reckon there would have been a lot of, well, I know there's a lot of funding being cut. Uh, so I, obviously that could segue nicely into that question, really. So what's kind of your thoughts on uh, the Olympics this the next year coming out? Now it's 2021. Yeah, I mean, I, I really feel for all the athletes <coughs> for 2020, and it's been very, very difficult for them. And with the judo, they're having to train in small bubbles. And if one of them gets you know tested positive the whole lot have to go back into self-isolation so really difficult in a, particularly in a, in, in a contact sport um in terms of the olympics i think it's going to be very different uh, i know they've, they've, they've said it is going ahead next summer in tokyo and they've been looking at different ways that they can try and manage the you know the, the situation the climate that we're in um so it could mean that there aren't so many spectators. It could mean that rather than the athlete's village, which for me was a major highlight of it. I mean, yeah. I remember you sort of walking out of your bedroom and there was my idol, Sally Gunnell, who had seen win her medals in 1992. I've been in the crowd and there she was. It was just like, yeah. wow. And having yeah. that whole intermixing with all the different sports and, and all oh. the different countries was... It, for me, that is very much part of what the whole Olympic thing is. It's definitely, it's definitely pulling everyone together. And, um, you know, I, I think they're looking at whether they use hotels and be able to keep people so they're not intermingling so much. So it'd be a very, very different experience. Yeah. I'm sure it'd feel amazing, but very different to my experience. So, again. so from like, uh, do you know of any kind of it has, has, has funding been like, is there, is there any like, um, funding been changed or is it? Is everything still the same for that four-year block in terms of an Olympic? Because I'm I'm a bit naive to an Olympic journey, so I don't understand. I don't know. Obviously, a four-year plan is it like your funding already there for the four years? Is yeah. that is that how that works? I, mean, I think they're actually looking at a twelve-year plan at the moment for going right. forward. It's you know the it, originally I remember when they're doing an eight-year plan, so they're looking longer term all the time. Obviously, right. it's reviewed regularly yeah. um but i think the the players that are on the sort of olympic program they still have their funding that yeah. that's still in place but it's it's it's, it's very different how they you know how are they how are they going to do their training they're normally traveling all over the world i know they had the judo had the european championships at the weekend and right. our, our team wasn't like, decided in the end they weren't going to go right. because um i think in the previous event the italian team they've been tested before they got on the plane they got off on the plane and already one person was tested positive within a day. I think all three yeah. of the team were tested positive. So that whole team, the ones that were, weren't tested positive, had to go home. And right. then the ones that were tested positive had to stay at their own expense for 14 days in, in, in the country that the event was in. And yeah. we couldn't really afford to do that. No, so. it's just not, not ideal. But I mean, I think the Olympics is going to come at like a really good time in terms of all things going well. 
like for the for the for world finance, for world entertainment again, for sport and entertainment again, because there's been a, a, such a shortage. Obviously, the f- football's been going on and like uh, the odd rugby thing, but it's just been so disjointed. I think that an event where it's all organised, all set in stone, should be a reignite a bit of a flame for sport. To be honest, because I feel as if there has been a lot of well, there's a lot of people within my community. There's a lot of people within my friendship groups that are, are kind of been turned off from the whole idea of sport, which is a, an absolute shame, to be honest, because of there's no crowds, there's no this, that, the other. There's, it seems all uh, very clinical and et cetera, et cetera. But I, I think that I, I keep saying to my, my pals and other people who we speak to that I think the Olympics and other kind of sporting events need to be, they, they need to be celebrated because like, it, it brings people together massively, massively. It does. It yeah. does. It. All, all sorts of people, and, and and same at sort of um, what do you call it? Um, resi- what, um, not necessarily the elite end. Yeah, grassroots level. Grassroots. Yeah. Grassroots levels. Yeah. Yes, I know we I got sort of involved with a local judo club, and, and we opened for a while between the first lockdown and this lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> and we had to. We would develop judo that was non-contact because we had to keep the social distancing and. It was just strangely, it was fabulous to actually just be on a map with people, even though you couldn't actually touch them physically. We yeah. started creating all sorts of stuff with rubber bands and, and interlinking our belts so that we could actually hold on to the belt and so you could pull and, right. and turn in for your techniques to so practice all the movements, keep the fitness going, practice some sort of groundwork movements, even without holding on to a partner. But yeah. bringing us all together, it felt different. And we, yeah. Now we're, we're doing Zoom, Zoom judo, yeah. which then you might think, how do you do Zoom, zoom how, judo? How, how, how do you do Zoom judo? <laughs> you get a bicycle, old bicycle tire, cut yeah. it, wrap it around the door handle, and then you've got something to pull on again, and then you can just practice turning in for throws. Right. Then there's a lot of fitness work. You can do like equipment of like a, a medicine ball on the floor and spin around on it. Right. So it builds your stomach, but it also practices that movement, which yeah. you'd like use a, if you do groundwork in the judo. A grapple technique kind of thing. Like, yeah, we've done a lot of wrestling and rugby, so kind of understand where you come from. But yeah, it's like, again, adapting to survive really, isn't it? Because yeah. you, have to, you have to do what you've got to do in order to keep things going. But leading on from that, I think that, yeah, I think the Olympics will, is going to be a massive thing for us. Uh, oh, also, I wanted to, I wanted to touch on, Joe, your, your style, so your, I was watching a couple of your fights, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of footage out there still, <laughs> so I watched a couple, and it's like, you seem to get a lot of holds and strangles, and so, talk us through what you, why, what was that, is that your, was that your thing, was that what you yeah. did? Was well, that your I thought she asked who was strangles, right. um, and it was strange because when I was when I was younger, I always thought I'd give up when we started doing arms and strangles because you don't actually do them when you're sort of younger, but when you're about 14, 15, you start learning them. Right. But actually, once I started, it was fine, and, and um, I love the fact there's no arguing who won. You right. know, there's no referee's decision. You know, if, if someone either taps or, or they go unconscious, if they don't tap, it, it's blatant who won. Um, I think one, one of my I was thinking the other day, actually, when the, the, the pivotal sort of competition, someone asked me, what was the main, the event, the, the actual match that made the biggest difference to your career? And it was at the Paris tournament. And it was the first time I was fighting under 66 kilograms. because I used to fight the weight, weight right. above. And I fought Emanuela Pimentosi. And she was Italian world champion. Um, my, again, another one of my big idols. And... I managed to just get her onto the ground and suddenly she was lying on the back, her neck was open. I just I don't believe it. <laughs> but she, on her. And she didn't tap, she did go unconscious, that she turned out, but having that win. She went unconscious up. Oh, there you go. <laughs> can't, you can't come back from that. <laughs> she was absolutely fine, but have, having that win was, was, was in many respects the trigger point that said to me, you know, you can get to the Olympics, you can beat the top in the world. You've just done it, and I actually yeah. had a bit of a couple of other really top players that same day, and, and I held on to that as I was sort of, so I didn't then get selected for the Olympics, which was that summer yeah. of 1992. But I held on to the fact that hold on a minute, I am up there with them. I just got to keep going. I was uh, I was someone with a little, quite a lot of self doubt uh, when I was playing, and like uh, before I got to play for Super League and whatnot, I was in that kind of same camp. I always 
had my own demons in my head saying, you're not good enough, this, that, the other, like hearing rap coaches' voices re repeating it when I've made mistakes and stuff like that. And I think there's a lot to be said for um, being able to quiet the mind and that those kind of things. I wish I, I wish I'd have known how to just back myself being, in, you know, like when I was, they, I wish I could tell the younger me. So I think that's like, I think that's what you're saying. Were you, did you see yourself as, did you have a little bit of self-doubt or were you always like, I know I'm going to be at this level or were you quite? No, you... I, 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 I did obviously have self-doubt doubt sometimes. And, and I know when I decided actually, you know, I'm going to, I was, I was doing a PhD um, around the time of the 1992 Olympics. And I was so gutted that I didn't get selected for it. I thought, do you know what, I'm going to just commit everything and pack in my PhD and, and go full out to try and go to the Olympics. And I told my dad, and he just said, well, you're not good enough. You are wasting your time. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm wasting my time. But at that point, I'd say that, that match that I'd had that previous year and, and the results, I just thought, no, I know I can do it. Yeah. But, you know, there, there were other times earlier in 1994, I... I just, I remember I lost at the British Open and I was absolutely gutted and my friends around me had gone on with their degrees, big careers, and I was thinking, well, oh, am I wasting my time? Um, but that, that was actually, again, another big turning point because yeah. I had about three days of thinking, actually, I probably should pack this in, but what else am I going to do? Help. Yeah. And, and then I just thought, do you know what? I'm traveling the world. I'm with all my friends. I'm doing a sport that I absolutely love quite enjoy that whole like how can I get better at it thing yeah. um why would I not want to keep trying to do that even if I don't get to the Olympics while I can while I'm fit enough young enough I'm able to do it and I haven't got any other big responsibilities <laughs> uh, um that sort of became a change of mindset actually for me so rather yeah. than just worrying about this big goal that, oh will I get there will I not am I good enough I'm not I just concentrated on the journey yeah. And, and enjoying it. And I won the European Championships like two months later. Definitely, and yeah. I'm sure it was down to change your mindset. Definitely, definitely. It's like once you realize that, like, that, I know it's kind of cliche, but it is about how you get, what you're doing to get there, not just uh, the, the goal. Because once you've, once, you've, once you've achieved that all important goal, you've always got another mountain to climb, whether it be another goal that you set or whether you be retiring or whatever. whatever you, step that is from that point it's still a journey no matter what you do so you can't just put the pin your hopes on getting to this one illustrious yeah. goal because that's when a lot of people do i know i've got a lot of friends who have fell short after that because they've gone into problems themselves because of they've just gone oh this is rugby's my life rugby's my life and then once it just gets pulled from underneath them like injury or whatever then you go down a, a, a spiral and it's like it's obviously having that mindset to be able to adapt again adapt and survive is kind of really pivotal and really important um so like kind of what advice would you give to like um you know this future generation of athletes now of of been around this kind of this 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 last year obviously been having knockdowns rejections um what would you kind of uh, one bit of advice would you give to people to say like 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 you just said then that you just thought i'm going to enjoy the journey what kind of would would that be a similar kind of advice that you'd give to someone yeah, I, 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 I think recognize it is hard. It's really hard. And if you, you know, you, you want to carry on and compete again, you've got to look for the advantages. How are you going to cope with it better than your opponents, your other competitors? Every, every lot of people have difficulties. You, also, you can quite often think, oh, I've been a bit injured and they're all really fit and that. You don't know what's going on. Quite often your opponents have been really injured or they've been really ill or they've had a bereavement. Everybody is having problems that they have to deal with. Yeah. So looking how do you make the best advantage of whatever yeah. situation you're in and, and keep picking it up, pick it up and keep going and keep on stepping with it. You know, yeah. you, you're going to have some backward steps, but if you keep on going, that persistence, intelligence, yeah. persistence, you yeah. know, but calculated persistence. Yeah. I think, I think like I've, I, I was, I was um, myself, I've been definitely naive to the fact that at times in my career that, I should have just uh, just progressed at a steady rate instead of trying to, uh, like you said, just try and don't, don't always, I did always kind of aim, I had, a, I had a goal in mind, but instead of just progressing, just ticking away day to day, I know it's going to be hard, I know it's going to be difficult. I think I fell short myself in certain aspects of my career doing that same thing where, so good advice would be just 
just keep keep going even though it might feel like you just just break down those larger goals into smaller goals and just keep keep going keep plugging away yeah um, of it, it's 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 what you do every day that makes the difference we you know you you're always trying to look for the the next way that you can get the edge that you can do but the most important thing is that you do stuff every day yeah. and, and finding a way that you can enjoy doing it every day i think is actually the key yeah. we, we spend an awful lot of time especially with all the knowledge we've got now on sports science and and, and you know analysis and things like that and they've all got their place <laughs> however if you're not doing something every day that even though it's hard, you're kind of enjoying it. And whether that's from the people you're doing it with or whether it's the feeling you get afterwards. I mean, I used to train for the cup of tea afterwards, a cup of tea in a chat with my friends. And, um, and that's, that made it enjoyable. And so I think, I think it's finding a way that you can do it every day is really key. So are you still um, are you still coaching now? Are you still co- are you still coaching within Manchester now, uh, judo? I do I do a little bit sometimes. I, I, I say I'm supporting my coach, um, who's my coach all the way through. He's now nearly eighty. Wow. So he, he's, he's he coaches at Ipon Judo Club, just sort of yeah. South Manchester, and yeah. at the university as well. So I've been trying to support him where I can because it, it's been a case of we got to learn. We got to know the knowledge we've got, but we got to learn to play the game differently because of the circumstances right. we are. And it's quite difficult to make those changes after 60, 70 years in, in, in doing it a certain way. Yeah. So, um, and we've also got a really talented young um, visually impaired player, Lauren, right. is, who's come on to the... Sorry, what's her, her name? Training with us. What's her full name? Lauren Wigglesworth. Wigglesworth, okay. Um, like that, yeah. is that, well, actually, my company, we're, we're sponsoring her now because she's right. just been selected for her first international next year. Amazing, amazing. Goes amazing, ahead. Cost, amazing, yeah. But, um, so I'd like to spend more time working with her and supporting her on that journey. Cause I think I actually saw, I think I actually saw something on LinkedIn, actually. You did, a, you did a bit of a post about it. Yeah. All yeah. oh, right. Okay. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay. Right, right. So how, so she, will that be the, 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 the Paralympics afterwards or how's what's the structure what's the structure like there is she just or is it the Olympics or is it the it would be the, it would be the Paralympics yeah. um I think I'd be pushing very much pushing it for this this next year yeah. but in four years time um if she keeps working as she's working and and, and that dedication let's see where that can go as a as a coach <clears throat> what's your kind of take on like how do you, i know it's it's totally different for because I've, I've i've had a coach on a rugby coach recently and i just it was interested to see what his uh, kind of answer was in terms of what's the main attribute that you need to be a coach in terms of having to have that man management skills or is it to be uh hard on you to make sure you just get all the drills right to make sure you're getting frequency or is it quality what's your kind of your main thing or is it all of the above my, my my take on it is all about coaching the person right so it's again it's about creating that environment that that works that makes it enjoyable yes they've got to do some technique work yes you, you you've got to be the training but the imp- most important bit is how do you get that person to want to do something they really don't want to do in the pursuit of something they really do want to do yeah. and um and so that's all about knowing the person asking questions get to know them outside the sport as well as inside the sport find out what's going on in their life a little bit when they turn up and then help them turn off about what's going on in their life so they can actually focus yeah and and creating that environment where it's okay to to get it wrong sometimes and they know they're supported that's uh, yeah exactly how i, I kind of I wish that there was in like kind of a rugby a rugby stance because the rugby rugby, rugby environment is a lot I'm not saying that all coaches are, but I mean, like a lot is kind of get it done or else kind of thing. And like, I found that when I was, uh, when obviously I was playing that there's, there's, there's a, about a 50, 50 or maybe a 60, 40 divide of, of people who respond to just overall criticism. I don't, th- I, don't I always think that you can't always respond to criticism. You have to have some constructive criticism, but I found there was a lot of negative criticism, but what I found best for me personally, and I know it was for a lot of other people, but they were they were they wouldn't say like I was like I responded well to being told, this is where you've gone wrong, and this is you're great at this, and this is how you fix X Y Z, and this is how, basically just being an an understanding 
on a level with a person, not just being, uh, not just shouting down at someone and making you feel like a kid. Cause I've got this vision of me when I was, uh, I was 14, 15, getting absolutely sh- killed by a coach. And then that, that, that image of me stuck in my brain every time I got kind of a shouting at, and it kind of like made you feel as if I was back to that 14, 15 year old who was a bit like meek and mild, like, Oh, what have I done wrong? Like kind of thing being like shouted at words. What you're saying there is absolutely perfect in terms of <clears throat> bringing someone in who might have family troubles, might have X, Y, Z, making them able to forget that for that hour, two hours that they're there and then getting the best out of them and in building the confidence up as well. I think that's like massively important that people don't think about just making, feeling like you are a bit of a friend, but though also you're strict at the same time. Is that yeah, kind of how yeah. you, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And there's that, it's, it's knowing each person differently. So my club coach from when, when I was younger, he, he again was an incredible coach. I've been very lucky. Um, he's one of the top coaches in the world, really, for judo. And he just seemed to know who, when we've been to a competition, we've gone to a competition on a Saturday, on a Sunday, we'd do the analysis of it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just seemed to know <laughs> who would respond really well to a, oh, what a load of rubbish that was. Come here, let's have a look at it. Uh, who just loved the attention, even yeah. though it was maybe, you know, making them saying, actually, you were rubbish at this and rubbish at that, you need to do that. And then there was me, and I remember sitting there thinking, please don't say anything about me, please don't say anything. And he never, ever once made me that sense of attention yeah. on, on, in, in, in that way. And I think that is about knowing, it's knowing your players yeah. and, and knowing how different people will respond to different things and not doing the same thing for everyone. Everyone's different. Yeah. And timings yeah. are different as well. Sometimes it works. Sometimes you need to kick up the backside. Yeah, but, definitely. Um, and that can be motivating, but it needs to be timed right. Yeah, that's uh, and I, I think that is like the biggest skill of a coach, isn't it? Just to be able to read that room, read that situation, read that changing room, and be able to, like you said, deal with people differently, not with the same brush, like having to broad brush everyone, which is um, yeah, really good point. Anyway, uh, Rowena, it's been brilliant to talk to you. I mean, I, I'm glad we were actually able to talk because I've been working with you for two years. And I don't, you don't really sit down and actually speak about past careers or anything, do you? So it's, I feel like these kind of talks have been really good because I've spoke to people like I wouldn't speak to people before, which is like kind of really enjoyable just to delve deep a little bit, dig a, dip, a bit deeper into people's careers and lives and see kind of what they're, they, they're doing now and what they have been doing. So thanks so much for your time. And um, I will see you soon at this, at, at our meeting at, at the uni soon. So, but uh, yeah, thanks so will. much. Thanks we'll so much for your time. Thank you very much, Rina. See you later. Thank you.